Good morning. I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about, I've been teaching the um, seven letters to the seven churches on Sunday night and the church of Ephesus that got so much right, um, had had seven um, condemnations, um, commendations, I'm sorry, <laughs> commendations from the Lord about how hey, you're doing so many things really, really well. But then he said, this I have against you, you've forgotten your first love. And I've really been sitting with the Lord and asking in what ways has the church forgotten um, our first love of Jesus Christ? And um, one thing he has really pointed out to me today that I've just kind of started last night and the Spirit's just been really heavy on me today is that we have accepted things from our country inside of the church, things that are done outside and then we brought them inside. And one of the number one things I want to talk today is about child sacrifice. Um, in modern day time, we call it abortion. It feels better. Um, but I'm going to call it child sacrifice because that is biblically what we are doing. Now, before you just turn me off and you're thinking, I don't want to have this conversation, it's outdated, I just want to encourage you to look at scripture, to listen to the Lord. And if you say that you are a believer and that you believe the things of God are above the things of man, then you must, we must sit and grapple with this issue once more. So when you look at child sacrifice in the scripture, we're just going to go to the scripture first, and we're going to talk about this from um, scripture. Leviticus 20 outlines for Israel, who Israel and America have extraordinary patterns together um, that we, we basically mirror so many parts of Israel and America um, or of ancient Israel and America's history line. So here in Leviticus 20, the Lord says to Moses, say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel, any one of the people or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself shall set my face against the man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given one of his children to Molech to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. And if my people of the land close their eyes to that man, I just, I'm just reading scripture to you. If my people of the land close their eyes to that man, when he gives his children to Molech and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his clan, and I will cut him off from among their people, him and all who follow him in the whoring that they are doing after Molech. Moloch was a god, a bull god of the day. Most people even um, um, like connect him to the god of Baal, who bottom line is Satan. It's different principalities possibly, but bottom line, it is Satan. God never asked for child sacrifice, for human sacrifice. That is the whole point of the Akedah in Genesis of when um, Abraham will bring Isaac up. You find that God is going to make a precedent there. I will never ask of your children what I'm going to actually perform and redeem through my own child, the, uh, um, who is Jesus Christ. And so here he lays out very plainly, you can't skip around it. You can't justify it. You can't stand and say to God, but God, what if we're starving to death and you're not showing up and I still need to sacrifice to Moloch? Well, God, what if someone writes an amazing article and I really understand Moloch's side of things and it just really feels murky and there's gray area here. God, what if there's mo so much more to the backstory than you really understand because you don't know what's happened to that family to cause them to get to the place to sacrifice their children to Moloch? It is um, widely accepted that Moloch was a giant statue, that its belly was a fire inside of it, and that they would pass the children into the fire and they would allow Satan to burn their children. And in um, exchange, they were asking for things, maybe money, maybe a better life, maybe health, maybe all of these things. We in America 
when we um, had Roe versus Wade, when we said that um, children in the womb are not children, and now we will pass them through the fires of the judgment of man and believe that there are no judgments of God, we started this in America. We set up Moloch as a um, something that even today they are arguing about every single day right now in these um, Senate meetings. Like they are arguing about whether or not we should be able and we should be allowed by our moral rights to sacrifice to Moloch. In the same way, though, we call God immoral when he allows other people to die, and yet we call ourselves moral as we sacrifice our children to Moloch. So we might have changed the names. We might no longer call this sacrifice, we call it abortion. We might now have a list of things that we say, well, what if this, what if that, what if this? And, but it's all still the same thing. This is sacrificing your children for careers, sacrificing the, your children for really hardship. I get that, my heart breaks, but the answer is never murder. And when we say, well, it's the right of the woman, right? It's her body, her rights. We don't actually believe that because the moment she tries to commit suicide, you're going to call 911 and you're going to stop her right over her own body. So we say it on one side of our mouth that we believe in the rights of women to make the decision for their own bodies. But if you apply that to committing suicide, we still take that individual because we believe they are suffering from mental illness. We believe they are suffering from depression and we will do something to stop them from murdering themselves. But we have come so far now to believe that an entire people group of um, creation, an entire people group of Americans are not truly people. This was the exact same thing that Hitler did when he dehumanized the Jews, when he came to saying the Jews are not real people, they're the lowest of the low, and we have the right to choose if they live or die. That is the same thing that we have done with the unborn children. And people are quoting over and over the, ver the verse from Proverbs that says, we should speak up for those that have no voice. And I want to tell you, these children have no voice more than anyone else because we're not even allowing them to take oxygen to speak. Everyone understands, and I, I, I understand there's a mass spirit of deception going on here, but you know that you know that when that baby is in the womb and the moment that baby passes into life, that baby is a human being. That baby is alive. And you know it because why do you grieve if you have a miscarriage? Why do you say, I'm sorry if a woman says I've had a miscarriage, even though you support the right to abortion? It's because in the inner being of you, you know it's not right for children to die in the womb. So here in Leviticus, it says, people of Israel, if you or even the strangers among you, do you know how I would see that today in, um, for us? I believe you could say people of America, of the American church, if you or the foreigners, the people that are not believers, if those around you do this and you, it says specifically, if you close your eyes to this, then it's speaking of the loss of humanity that you are going through. You do not any longer believe that the God of Yahweh has created all men in his image. You do not believe in the sanctity of life, which Rabbi Zacharias, when he was asked about this question, said, I will forever have to stand for the sanctity of life because it is one of the most principal issues of Christianity. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sanctity of life to bring back man towards to God because sin had killed him. And we must stand on these issues. We cannot back down because we're tired of talking about them. But let's go a little bit deeper here into scripture. We're going, I want you to jump over to the book of Jeremiah, and then we're going to go to Isaiah. So the place that they actually did the child sacrifices to Moloch is called the Valley of um, Topheth. Okay, um, Topheth was here, and it, uh, this history of Topheth is that there are six words, one, two, three, six words in the Bible for hell. 
There is Hades, there is Tartarus, there is Abuso, and there's Gehenna, and there is Topheth, okay? Topheth is one of the words that we see that start re starts referring to a physical place on earth and a spiritual concept. I want to present to you that Topheth, at one point in time, was believed to be a beautiful garden, a lush, gorgeous garden. And then the Israelites began to child, began child sacrifice to Moloch within this area, Isaiah 30, 33. Um, you see this with 2 Kings 23.10, Jeremiah 7, 30-34. They started sacrificing their children to Moloch, which in and of itself, I want to tell you, is a huge um, red flag that something is wrong with the heart. The heart is deceitful above all else. And if you start getting to the place where you justify abortion, I read an article last night where a woman was saying, I had to give birth at 25 weeks to my baby. Don't you realize this is late term abortion? And she was saying, we have to have laws that protect that. And I just, if I could speak to that woman, I would hug her and love her. And I do love her. I do not mean to speak ill towards her, but we have to speak truth and tell her, honey, you didn't have an abortion. You gave birth and gave the child the chance to life that is extraordinarily different. And then you are mixing two things together that do not go together. You did not go in your womb and pull that baby apart piece by piece or, or drown him in saline solution because you thought that baby couldn't live. You gave birth to the baby and you gave a possibility of life. Every time someone brings up the issue and says, hey, what is it that's going to kill the mother? The answer has never been murder the baby. The answer has always been then go into labor, right? This is what hospitals have done forever and ever. Then allow the chance for both of you. Go into labor if you need to. But we don't say then you kill one, right? You don't have that answer. And it is a, phalli um, a fallacy argument to bring that up. So here in Jeremiah 7, verse 30, it says, For the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. So what is the evil that Judah has done? I, God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we have got to stop justifying abortion and saying, oh, this is a new word, a new term. It is called child sacrifice. He says, they have set up detestable things in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They have built high places of Topheth, which is in the Valley of the Son of Henan. Okay, that's the Valley of Gehenna, right? To burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command them to do. And it did, did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will be no more called Topheth or the Valley of the Son of Henan, but the Valley of Slaughter. For they bury in Topheth because there is no room elsewhere. And the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and none will be frightened, uh, will frighten them away. And I will silence in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become waste, declares the Lord. We need a time, just like the church of Ephesus did, of remembering that this is the word of God of remembering that God alone declares what is truth, not us. No, you cannot write enough articles. You cannot write a blog post of justifying the sin of our nation. We must remember that God has said, this is a detestable thing. This is a wicked thing. It defiles the church to align with this, with align with the sacrifice and murder of children. And he says here, it will silence the voice of the bridegroom. It will silence the voice of the bride. We are called right now to be the bride. And I believe this is a voice that needs to be um, raising up is that we remember that God has said this is evil, detestable. If you, R.C. Sproul said, above all else, I can tell you God hates abortion. It is, you don't even have to wonder if he hates it. He hates the murder of innocent life in the womb of the woman. It was never supposed to be a tomb. It was supposed to birth a life to the world. And then we need to, as Ephesus, once we remember, 
we need to repent. We need to repent and realize this is silencing the voice of the bride and silencing the voice of the bridegroom because we can't hear Jesus when we start justifying murder. When we start justifying the sin, we are silencing the voice of the one that we want so desperately and we are silencing the voice of the bride. We have, have answered this by saying go to abortion clinics and, and have picket signs and yell at people. I believe so much that R.C. Sproul so long ago said this very wise words. He said, why are you picketing at the abortion clinics? That is not how we need to go about this. If you want to picket, if you want to speak to anyone as the church, go to the churches that are justifying this. Go to the pastors that are teaching this from the pulpit. Go to the Christians that are putting things up and justifying this amount of detestable, dark, evil sin. And you talk to them. Protest the churches. I'm serious. Don't don't be a part of this. If we have pastors that are teaching that abortion is the right of a woman and that it's outdated, it's old fashioned to listen to the words of God, God's words are not unclear. God's words are not muddled and they are not gray. They are st straight up telling you right here, it is a detestable thing and that do not call it by my name and do not defile my ways by telling people they can do this. In Isaiah 30, verse 33, it says, For a burning place has long been prepared. Indeed, the king has made its ready. Its pyre made deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of sulfur, kindles it. I believe this concept of Topheth, why Jesus uses Gehenna. Remember, it's the valley of um, Henan, which is where we get the word Gehenna from. Jesus uses it 11 times to talk about hell. There is a form of hell that is spiritual, that um, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, if you choose to live in rebellion, that is the, the final resting place of you, of those that do not believe. But there is also a hell on earth, a burning that you can see literally on earth. We've seen the pictures of the Holocaust concentration camps, and we know that the church allowed that hell on earth to exist in Germany. And they sang their songs, their great songs um, in their churches as the trains went rolling by with full of voices of those crying out that were being sent to the gas chambers that were sent to be burned in piles and piles of this trash that they said were human beings. Church, when we allow something like abortion to become a single voter issue, when we allow something like abortion to become outdated, outfashioned, don't discuss it anymore. We are listening to the trains going by of the millions upon millions of generations that we have said, well, I'm not the one doing it, or well, I'm not involved here. We must, as a nation, as a church that knows better, remember the words of God and hold them above all opinions of man. We must repent for what our country has done. And I repent, and I wanna to admit to you, I have let these issues just go down under the waters of my spirit because I'm tired of hearing of them, and I'm tired of fighting for them, but I hear the Lord and he's crying out saying, are you not the bride? Are, do you not know the truth? Did you see me tire when I was on the earth and just start stepping back and going, you know what? I just don't want to talk about it anymore. No, I came to bring light to the darkness. And if you silence the bride, then the voice of the bridegroom will be silenced in your church as well. You will no longer hear from the Lord because if you align with the valley of Tothfith, for with the valley that was once a beautiful garden, but then became a burning muck of trash because they sacrificed their children there. What a picture of the Garden of Eden and what we've done to the earth. God did not mean for us to live in such brokenness. He created a beautiful garden of peace and love where others, every child could be valued. And yet we live in a broken, broken world I want to tell you, I hear so often that the conversation about abortion cannot stop just at don't murder. And I agree. We need to be people that are helping our neighbors. 
We need to be a people of foster care. We need to be a people of adoption. My family is a people of adoption. We need these things, but please church, do not use that conversation to stop the first conversation, which is abortion is an abomination to God. It is child sacrifice. And there's no other way to put it. So I encourage you to stand up for the sanctity of life because Jesus Christ died for all men. We have murdered more in the United States than they killed in the Holocaust. The church was silent when Hitler took over. And I, we've, we saw this church was silent so often in Venezuela and all of these other places. And I believe that this is the season where the Lord is saying, bride, where is your voice? Has your voice become silent? It does not mean that we get angry or hate-filled. We love those. And if you have had an abortion, there is a well of forgiveness for you. This does not mean that God is done with you any more than he was done with me. For I have fallen short of the glory of God. For I have sinned again and again against my father. And my sin is no worse or no better than anyone else's. I just pray that we become a people who remember, repent, and return to the truth of the gospel. Amen.